Hollywood actors beware. Their jobs are in jeopardy. Whether they know it or not, or they like it or not, they don't have a choice. Welcome to the Evolpreneur AI Advantage Show, and I'm your host, Richard Ray. My mission is to help entrepreneurs understand AI and use it to their advantage. Join me today where we dig deep with our guests and get you the best concepts and strategies. Today's special guest is Dave Poulos. Dave has over 40 years of marketing experience, covering private enterprise, government, non-profit, and charitable organizations. Today we're talking about the wild, wild west of AI. Who owns what? Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Richard. Appreciate it. Great to have you here, Dave. And as ever, I ask all my guests, where in the world are you? I am currently located in Maryland, just north of Baltimore and just south of Pennsylvania. Beautiful part of the world, no doubt. So Dave, um, like a lot of my guests, you have such an amazing bio and I merely scratched the surface. So is there anything I've missed off? Uh, and you know, tell us a little bit about your history that uh, you really would like the listeners to know about. I have probably functioned within 20 or 25 different roles in my career. Vast and varied and coming from every direction. And it gives me a lot of depth because I can draw from a whole lot of different resources and circumstances to apply them to my clients' problems. I've worked with everybody from MasterCard and Walt Disney to Madison Square Garden, uh, all the way down to tiny little liquor brands and small uh, food packaging charitable organizations, runs, you name it. And that kind of depth is what gives me the framework to help my current fractional CMO clients really hit the ground running and get ahead of the game. So do you find that that breadth of experience means you can just grab a little bit of information from one place and you'll fill in the really big guys and a little bit from one of the small guys you've worked with and really give people a perspective that they wouldn't normally get? Absolutely. Because sometimes if you're within an industry, there are tricks that other industries use or techniques that other industries use that you can adopt or adapt to the current client. And, and nobody's done them before because they don't have that experience. They're myopic. They're tunnel visioned into what their industry does well. Well, if I'm in, talking about telecom companies and I'm doing a sweepstakes like a, a, a bank or a food company, that's going to come out of the woodwork. That's that's going to be a very strange but very effective disruptive occurrence in that marketing scheme, and people are going to respond to it because it's new and it's different. That makes complete sense. So, Dave, tell me, today's title, The Wild, Wild West of AI, and it's not the first time I've heard that particular phrase used around AI, and I've got to say I agree with it up to a point, but the second half, who owns what? What's your thinking here? A lot of it comes down to the fact that the regulatory and legal framework in the U.S. has not kept pace with the technological innovations that AI allows or its growth. If you're doing uh, developmental AI, you're doing generative AI, you're doing things that are creating what look like new work, but that everything is derivative of something else depending on what the databases you're using to draw that AI algorithm from. So if you're asking AI to write you a book about one given topic. It has to delve into that language model and come up with other works to use as a model and bring it forward. So you're using someone else's words to write yours. So who owns it? AI wrote it. You didn't write it. So you don't own it. And AI doesn't own it. So whose is it? If you're creating an illustration and you go into mid-journey and you say, I want a picture of a dragon with some clouds and, and feathers coming off of it and somebody shooting a lightning bolt. At it. Well, there's probably 50 examples that come within one or two of those parameters. It's going to jam them all together and come up with what you want in the style you told it to. Now you have what's called an original piece of art ostensibly. But is it really original? Have you stolen pieces from 60 or 70 other pieces of art? And can you copyright it? Because it's obviously pieces of somebody else's uh, intellectual property. It creates a lot of problems. So, so, to play kind of devil's going. so to play devil's advocate with this then, there is, you know, the often quoted statement of, you know, that there's nothing original. Nothing is truly original. You know, you could I argue that... Under the sun, what, for sure. Exactly, exactly. So you could argue that West Side Story was a take on Romeo and Juliet. Sure. Okay. 
and people who West Side Story, and it's a, a great musical, great show. Sure. Uh, as his only brother, brother Art Thou, the Coen brothers stole it directly from from uh, Greek philosophy. Exactly, exactly. So how does that differ? Like how can that differ? Or so how does it differ from what you're describing with AI? Because AI is not pulling the words even one at a time in some cases. They're pulling phrases, paragraphs, sentences, you know, whole sections in some cases. It's, it's bordering on plagiarism with minor edits. It's not come up with a new twist on an idea. It's not come up with a different angle on an idea. It's simply using what's there and assembling it. It's like a giant erector set for Word. And it just puts this thing together in what it thinks, based on reading 75 other examples, makes sense. So it's part of the biggest problem that people who aren't putting the effort in, and let's take you know West Side Story as the example, so, you know, yes, there may be the same basis of the story, but, you know, there's a whole set of musical uh, you know, songs written. There's a whole new take on things. And humans had to put in something truly creative there, and it took talent. Whereas with AI, somebody can just say, create me this, bang, and you're good to go without having any real ability in that area. Right, you're not creating anything. You're just assembling from existing. If you had really to take in... songs from Hello, Dolly, and put them behind West Side Story, you would be doing something very AI-like because it would have the same rhythms, the same tempos, the same framework. It's a song, and it would be recognized by AI as a song. The fact that it's completely nonsensical to the source of the material that you're seeing on the stage wouldn't matter. The creativity and the objectivity is not there. I'm wondering how many more musical references we can get in today, so I'm, I'm looking forward to this. But let, let's just keep going here. So now I hear what you're saying. So my, my interest in this then is people create something and then they put it out as their own. Do you think that the public can tell the difference? Because something I've quoted in the past, there was an ad back in the 1970s in the UK and it was for a certain type of burger. And the mum brought home these burgers and the kids tried them and they went, mum, these are not our regular burgers. And the line was, they might look the same, but they don't taste the same. So will the public be able to discern, or will they not care in the fullness of time? I think you're going to have a big adjustment period. Back in the late uh, 1980s, National Geographic, on its cover, posted a photograph of a woman, an Arab woman with green eyes. She was probably 11 or 12 at the time. That was not an actual photograph. That was one of the very few early sort of pre-Photoshop mm -hmm. composite photographs. They altered her appearance. They altered the background. They put her in a place she was never been and quoted it as their own. National Geographic, internationally known for photographic quality and integrity, had taken a flyer and said, we're going to make something artistic on this cover and call it a photograph. People and so did they, did they admit to this? Did, did they let people know that it wasn't uh, no, the original image? No, they never said anything about it. If you okay. wrote in and asked, they would admit to it on an individual basis. But there was never a statement issued. There was never a disclaimer. They never published anything that said this was an, uh, an enhanced image. They just put it on the cover and let it set. Readers were up in arms when they discovered this. They were fan mail for weeks about how this was you know, ruining the integrity of the image and yada, yada, yada. They went back and revisited that same gal 20 years later and took another picture of her for real. And you could clearly tell that the image had been adjusted. And then you huh? sort of age it up in your mind and you see where the adjustments fell flat and it didn't work. One of the very few problems with copyright law, that because they owned all the images they had composited, it was fine legally. But that's not true of AI-generated images because you don't own the copyrights to all the stuff in that database that it's going to pull to make that photograph. So now you've got an issue of ownership. And intellectual property is a very murky area of the law to start with. There's a lot of ambiguity and a lot of room for interpretation. And we've just opened the door to a whole lot more. As far as determining whether something is fake or not, already teachers are forced to submit essays and school papers and, and even you know dissertations to see if they're plagiarized into a specific website that knows how to look for AI-issued stuff and will feed it back as saying, no, this is stolen or no, this is AI-generated, so that they'll get a good grade on it. It's already started. We already know that there's fakes out there. Where this really starts to run into a problem, picture the news footage of the white Bronco 
slow speed chase with OJ in it. All they would have had to do was change the color of that car and make it a little longer. Suddenly now it's a black Tahoe and mm -hmm. you're not seeing the real thing anymore. Who's to know what's legal and what's not legal? How many court cases have been decided on a videotape from a security camera? Photograph somebody got on a camera. Some of that stuff, if it's submitted as evidence, now it's so difficult to tell whether that's fake or real or not. And even the experts would have to tear it apart pixel by pixel to determine whether it actually existed as another image or not. So we're going to run into, into legal battles that there will be court cases overturned because the evidence submitted was falsified in one way or another or generated out of whole cloth to look like someone else did it. So we've got a situation there. Where, you know, there's the oft-quoted phrase of, you know, the camera never lies, which is one of the biggest lies ever because it's been, you know, you've been able to change things on celluloid for sure. decades, you know, centuries even. But it sounds to me that the biggest challenge in that particular part of what you're talking about is that it's now so easy and with simple tools that don't take any tr significant training, nope. just about anybody can do this. Correct. It's so widespread and so easily accessible. And it makes it something that the average person would allow to cross their mind were they to get caught up crosswise in something. Well, we can easily fake that. Let me generate something out of AI that replaces this and submit that. It's so simple and so straightforward and so low cost. The barrier to doing it is almost gone. So before you had a production barrier, you had a cost barrier, you had a time mm. constraint. Skill barrier. All these things, talent on top, to mm. be able to do it all. Now you don't need any of those things. You need a keyboard and some imagination. Everybody so some that. of the positives that I like to talk about with AI are how it can enable you if you're missing one piece of the puzzle. Let's say you've got a great business idea and you know it's going to work. You've got customers, but you don't have a business plan to take it to the bank. And you can use AI to write that. That's a positive thing. Absolutely. At least I do it all the time. Exactly. But it's with any tool, you can use it in a negative way. One of the things that I find interesting is I've we've already seen recently that in Europe, the European Union has started to write legislation to try and do something about it. But as with all governments, I'm not calling out any specific government or any politicians, how on earth can the political side of things keep up with this? It's very, very difficult. My thought is, A, they're politicians. They've, they've had their imaginations amputated. Um, but on top of that, uh, you have to imagine everything. You have to think like a liability lawyer. What mm -hmm. could happen if this happened? You have to go through so many if-then scenarios before you can actually craft legislation that could handle all of the possibilities and cover things and not be too vague so that it, it's ineffective. You, you're constantly walking a balancing act between is there too much specificity in this bill or this legislation that we could possibly have forgotten something and now we've created a loophole? Or is it too vague in general and we've hampered innovation and the use of the technology at all in order to apply to the legal side? Of things? So you've got this balancing act going on all the time when you're trying to write that legislation. Depending on what your lobbying strength is and your special interest group direction might be, that's going to change. That balance is going to shift depending on which audience you're really trying to serve. So if you're in the pocket of Microsoft, um, you know, you're going to want to write that thing as open as possible to allow for full use and, and this, that, and the other with just a couple of specific no-nos. If you're, say, someone in the intellectual property field, you're going to want to put every possible instance you can imagine in that thing and write it so broadly that it covers the whole gamut. So to protect your clients. This is very interesting because... You see examples out there, I believe Paula Abdul is in the middle of a case against OpenAI, the people behind ChatGPT right now. Uh, but ChatGPT have made the statement that if you create something using their con uh, using their system and there is a legal case against you, they'll back you up. So is it just that they've got so much money because of that Microsoft backing? Or is it that they genuinely believe that they've got a good legal argument to say, well, no, we this is truly created by AI and you're doing good things? I think they're going to find that there is one case that they will use over and over again as a precedent. They will find mm -hmm. something that was very, very effective in that case where they'd win and say, okay, this is now our stance. This is where we're going to, to fall back to in almost all of these cases because it applies broadly to everything and defend AI as a concept as much as they are the case itself. Interesting. 
Going back to the legislative part of it, as I mentioned before, the European Union has created legislation. And I'm sure that people in Asia and America are really taking notice of that and what they do. Actually, no, they won't be. They won't care. They'll just be getting on and creating their systems. But is it even possible to legislate when you've got a global system? The Internet's been with us for decades now. And, you know, the whole thing of putting a server offshore and not worrying about these things. This sounds incredibly challenging. Is it? This is a tsunami that we can not even get close to stopping. It's very, very difficult to put up barriers on a global basis for something that is truly global like the Internet. They've tried to tax things that were sold on the Internet with very little success. They've tried to legislate use of the Internet with very little success unless you're talking about China or Russia possibly because they can choke off at the international intercontinental T T one line or whatever they're using, mm-hmm. um, they they can choke it off at the actual source of the internet itself. But it's amazing how many people seem to get around that. Certainly, when they, I talk to people, there's always a workaround, and and that goes the same with the with back to your question. No matter what they develop, there's going to be people that will figure out a workaround. The the imaginative and creative amongst us will find this hampering and figure out a way to fix it and get around it, just as we did the laws that were already in place for things like copyright when you're pulling stuff off Google. You're violating copyright laws. How many of those are actually prosecuted? A very small percentage. The ones that belong to stock shops will get prosecuted because they have a precedent in place. Um, Things like handicap access. Europeans are far ahead of us in terms of legislating and and recommending uh, different ways for for handicap access to internet websites. Uh, The U.S. has not adopted, what is it, uh, GPQR or I'm trying to think of the standard. Don't don't know it off the top of my head. But uh, there's there's a handicapped access standard in, in mm-hmm. the UK and, and uh, NATO countries that uh, make sure that people that are hard of hearing uh, have access to printed text and people that can't see very well have access to scaling of type and that sort of thing on every website that those people... So there's really not a, an even playing field regardless of no. where you are in the world. Your laws are different than my laws and they've got to work within their own framework on native soil. So if if I legislate something global... And it goes completely contrary to what the British have thought is is good legislation for freedom of speech versus America's version of freedom of speech, which is a different than Poland's version of different of yep. freedom of speech. You cannot put a global blanket over the. You top can't police it. Nobody control. can police it. It's not going to work. And you don't have any enforcement power outside of your own nation anyway. And the internet is global and it crosses borders effortlessly. So how are you going to how are you going to legislate it and how are you going to enforce it? You're not. I'd like to just delve in for a second using your experience in the marketing world. And you mentioned the Nat Geo um, kind of cover earlier on in the story. The whole thing of how people's perception has changed. It went to the point where, you know, we started off with people got really annoyed about that original photo of uh, the young woman. Mm-hmm. And there was uproar. And then now we there's probably not a photo on a magazine cover that isn't photoshopped in some way. Nope, okay. not anymore. Not anymore. But then we get the more recent case of Sports Illustrated, where they admitted that some of their stories had been written using AI. And Sports Illustrated is no longer with us. Now, I'm not saying that's why it went under, but I'm sure it didn't help. <laughs> no, it did not. Their decline was already in progress when that came along. And I think that it may be a chicken or the egg thing. Did, did mm-hmm. the legislation and, and subsequent prosecution kill it, or was it already dead and they were using AI as, as a backstop because they couldn't afford it? It's to keep it going a little bit longer, yeah. <laughs> so, it but could be think, tumbling you know, over and over and over again. Yeah, but but with the, the concept of the digital native, you know, the, the kids that grew up at where, and they've only known a time when the internet has been here. Right. We're obviously going to have the equivalent for AI. People will grow up. And they will be bombarded with images, sound, video, text, written using AI, and it's going to get better. You look at the difference with you look at the differences when you compare the original AI videos of Will Smith eating spaghetti that are used against the latest stuff from Sora, and in the space mm-hmm. of a year, it went from yep. being some horror show into something that you're like, that's um quite scary how good that is. That's right, Hollywood actors beware. Their jobs are in jeopardy, whether they know it or not, or they like it or not. They don't have a choice. It, it, $16 million to have some guy you know, play dress up for an hour 
versus almost nothing to have the AI version of that same guy prancing around the stage for two hours. It, it, Hollywood's not stupid. It's a business. They're going to start figuring out there's ways to get around these exorbitant salaries and fees to do this stuff. So that's one battleground that needs to be addressed almost immediately because that's a very popular touchstone for everyone culturally. If you're looking at a movie and it's not the guy you think it is because he was never there, are you really watching one of his movies? Mm. It's a big question in people's minds, and it's going to piss people off when they're looking at an AI version of an actor that never got the part. It's going to be very strange. So taking that again, that analogy again, I, I you know being the big film nerd that I am, Oh, there's lots of examples where people have ripped off other movies. Okay, so you know, you, you look at some of the work. I shouldn't say ripped off, but you know, Quentin Tarantino. And there's there's plenty of things that he's borrowed from other movies. Or you go back in time, and Sean Connery's brother played a secret agent in a very very bad film in the '60s, but it had lots of other Bond actors in there. And then yeah. you talk about Asylum Pictures as well when they create their mockbusters. So right. It, so where's the difference here? Because, again, is it just that it's so easy to do it now? Or in the next five years, when we look at what's happening, we could literally create a whole movie with a single prompt at our desk? I think it's not only is it is the ease impacting the desire and the capability to do it, lowering the barrier to entry, but I'm also looking at we're going to develop a very keen sense of authenticity as this grows, as audiences. I mean, you can you can take your example one step further, and say that uh, Armin Flit was a ripoff of James Bond, which it was. It was intended that way, but it was a spoof as well. There's a, there's a much more of a fun tone to it, right? It's it's a it's a sarcastic parody version of the same thing. James Coburn, yeah, changed I remember a few correctly. lines in the script. Had they changed a few lines in the script and gone with a little more serious demeanor and thrown a few more thousand dollars at the sets you would have been hard-pressed to tell the difference. Mm. So, again, it's a matter of degree as much as in how unreal is it, how unauthentic is it, how much are we willing to tolerate. And I'm guessing just as the quality of video, of photography, of typography, of writing has slid downhill over the years as things have gotten easier, you remember reading magazines when they actually knew about typography. All the columns were perfect. There were no widows and orphans. All the spelling was perfect. You look at any internet document at this point they're all screwed up nobody knows how to do this stuff anymore because it's not necessary we don't care good enough has become good enough and how standards are for print that's how standards are for magazines that's how standards are for images stuff is blurry it's badly framed it's out of focus but it's on the internet so it's okay video production is the same way guys standing there with your phone is not the same as that 14k image capture machine that costs twelve thousand dollars it's just not the same so although they've shot movies with phones, it, it doesn't really look the same and it doesn't act the same. It doesn't hit your sensors in the same way. And I think we're going to develop that same sense. Of, well, it's just kind of AI junk. Oh, here's one that the guy actually sat down and wrote. And you mm -hmm. can tell subconsciously that it's done by a person rather than by a machine. It's almost like the, uh, some of these films that are created, say, on a phone. Uh, the phone part of it is the gimmick because would they really be telling you it's been created on a phone if it wasn't something that they wanted to use to their advantage. The story's weak. Uh -huh. So they use the phone as a gimmick to get you to accept it more readily. Yeah. I mean, there's been plenty of examples where there might be something like a new type of special effect that has been used in a movie for the first time. You go along, the effect's great. The movie's off. Mm -hmm. We didn't need to tell it. Yeah. No. It was exactly. just one more way to get some eyeballs on the movie. So, but where does the line get drawn then on the creative side? And again, we, we talk about the ownership part of it very briefly. If you've got somebody who has a great idea and talent and can create something, but doesn't necessarily have all the resources. I mean, I think about Peter Jackson and his very early films. Yes, he went on to do all the amazing things with Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. But if you go back to his very early films, it took him years to make his first film, Bad Taste. You know, he built a tank. He made his own guns as props. And when you watch the movie, you see all that talent there and those flourishes, those early days. But it literally took years for him to do a single movie that led to the rest of his career. Sam Raimi, similar sort of thing when we go back to The Evil Dead. You know, it's him and a bunch of friends running around the forest sure. with cameras strapped to planks of wood to try and, right. you know... Blair Witch Project. Exactly, Very this sort of thing. So there's those people that have always wanted it and make it happen, but it can take 
but there's so much talent out there. Is this an enabler of talent or will that talent just get squished by the major organizations when they get hold of this and say, right, we don't need to be paying Tom Cruise, you know, tens of millions of dollars to do this movie anymore. My thought initially is that resources are always going to trump lack of resources in almost every arena you can think of. That doesn't mean that a, a poor movie with lots of resources is going to be a better watch mm -hmm. than a cheap one with a guy with real imagination and creativity behind it. Whether it took him six times as long to do and had a, a very meager budget, I look at clients all day long and say, you know, if you only had more budget, as a marketer, that's my job is to tell people to spend more money. Of course. Um, but I've always seen budgets as a challenge, not as a constraint. Because anybody can can look at the Barbie movie. You can do anything you want with, with a $50 million marketing budget mm -hmm. or more. If I had had a, a tenth of that, could I have been as effective at marketing that movie? Probably. Because I just don't throw money at stuff. I throw creativity at stuff. And then find a way not to make it so expensive. So there's a difference. The, the creativity is going to overwhelm the resources, and there'll be a tipping point at some point. But we look so at the, we, we have to work up to that tipping point. So we look at the recent Godzilla movie, uh, Godzilla minus one, and that won the Oscar for best special effects, and it was a sixteen million dollar movie. Yeah, versus you know the, much. all these the effects are here exactly. Here. You know, and, and and it's creativity and talent. That goes yes. with it. And so it sounds to me, and this, this could be quite a useful thing for anybody that's listening. Just because you've got AI doesn't mean you're going to produce something great. Yes, it can get you started, but you've got to eke out every last bit of benefit from those dollars that you're spending or that system. Because we've all seen movies that have had huge amounts of money thrown at them or marketing campaigns thrown at them. And they've been awful. I think of it this way. Have you ever seen those guys that make Sears at the Beach? Yeah. Big, large-scale sculpture. Always impressive. Always impressive because there's a tremendous amount of talent behind it. Now, you could pick up his tool bag and a bucket of water and go out to the beach and hand it to me. And I'm not going to be able to come up with using the exact same resources. Mine is not going to look like that because I don't have the skills, the tools, the practice the the imagination, the creativity, and the training to make that happen. Same tools. AI is a tool if you look at it that way. So just because you have the tool in your hand doesn't mean the result is going to be something that's on par with everyone else. Recently, I've been hearing the concept of the post-knowledge age, which is when AI has been with us for, say, 10, 20 years in its current format. You know, We've had AI for a long time. But people have got so used to just using AI that those basic skills to understand how something works have been lost. And it's a generational thing. You know, I always argue that if you take a bunch of 20-somethings right now and give them a paper map and say get from point A to point B, then they're not going to be able to do it in comparison to people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. That's a skill that's been lost. But then again, there's not so many blacksmiths around either that can uh, shoe a horse anymore. Yeah, buggy whip industry is kind of in the dumps these days. I mean, um, it doesn't matter how you market it. It's, I mean, I'm sure you've got skills, but you know, it's, uh, let's not get worried there. I put my 16 so, year old daughter in front of a rotary phone a year ago, <laughs> and she had no clue as to how to work it. It's gone. It's lost. But for the same token, I can still use it because I used it when I was her age. So I know it's not that that you can't figure it out. You'll figure it out eventually. It's just there's no need for the knowledge. Anymore. So, so will there not be a need to create because we have AI? No, I don't think that's true. Will there not be a need to slog through endless revisions, edits, um, ideation sessions, and everything else to create basic stuff for business transactions? Absolutely. Why, why would I need to know that if I don't have to? Um, kids don't know how to do memorization of any kind. They're not taught memorization of any kind. They can't even write in cursive anymore because everything's through a keyboard and on a screen. They don't need it. So they don't teach it. And I'm and I'm skill. so glad I don't have to write cursive anymore because that was shocking. But <laughs> it's an obsolete it's skill, and there are lots of those. We've pointed out quite a few examples. Hmm. Creativity is never going to be one of those skills that's going to be obsolete. 
Man is hardwired to improve his environment to his own advantage. That is the essence of creativity. So going beyond that, it's never going to go away. What tools it has available and how often it gets used and for what may change. But the inherent need to create is, is hardwired into our DNA and will not change. And do you worry, though, that because people will have lost a whole set of skills, although, you know, there'll be a huge amount of people that won't have that background growing up with the learning phases that you would have gone through, will it change things or will it be a case of, hey, no, you've just got a great idea. I'm just going to do something. Bang. My idea is now real because of AI. I think the idea would be real. I don't know that the idea would be good. And there's a significant difference there because things that are real don't always work well. Things that are good do. So again, there's going to be a discrimination point somewhere where somebody's got to say this is viable and this is not, no matter how it was created. So in, in business and in marketing and in everything else, the, the marketplace will decide whether it's a good idea or not. And that's not going to change either. As long as there's some sort of quid pro quo exchange for whatever that idea generates, somebody's got to buy it. Nobody buys it. It's not a good idea. So under those circumstances, that will may be altered, but will never go away. It, it does make me think of a line I heard once. There was a British comedian uh, called Bernard Manning, and he was somebody who was very rude. You know, lots of swearing, lots of, you know, racism, sexism. But he was also a very smart man. And he said the line one time was, funny is funny. It doesn't matter if it's racist, sexist people will find some of these things funny, which is awful. But we've all heard jokes that aren't, uh, you know, something we might say in polite company. It is still laugh or we still smirk. Sure. And if, on the inside, if something's... We laugh. Yeah. It's based in a reality that we understand. And that's all you need. And as you all say, good jokes have a grain of truth to them. And if they didn't, it wouldn't be funny. <laughs> but as you say, if something is good, something is good. Whether yeah. it is a movie made on a fraction of the budget of a Hollywood movie as we talked about with Godzilla Minus One, or whether it is a line in a marketing campaign which really hits a nerve with you know, the public. So back to the premise of today. Who owns what? Who do you think owns what, Dave? I think that if you are typing and creating the prompt that generated that work, you are a partial owner with the codicil that you credit AI for the vital product. I think that's how it's going to shake out. I think that's how you're going to do ownership. There will be a fund created at some point by either the, the IMF or some equivalent that will say, every time you, you receive a, a, a gratuity or you receive a, a residual payment from one of the payment companies for your movie or your music or your book, part of that residual payment is going to be sliced off and going to go into that fund to fund research, to fund legal defense, mm -hmm. to fund this, that, and the other. Because oh, you're only a partial payments. owner. You only get a partial payment. AI gets the other part, and that fund is, is its payment. I think that's and it looks like Amazon's. Scenario. It looks like Amazon's already doing that because when you submit a book now, they actually ask you how much of this has been written by AI. Do they portion the, 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 the uh, revenue by percentage? Not at this point, but uh, <laughs> who knows what will happen next. Bezos might see that as a viable model. Yeah, I'm sure there's scenarios. <laughs> let's, 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 let's not hope he doesn't hear this, okay? <laughs> we'll keep that one to ourselves. I wouldn't, nobody's listening to that bit. Okay. <laughs> so, Dave, great conversation. I wish we could keep going with this, but I've got to ask you, man, if there was one piece of advice that people can take away from our conversation today, what would it be? I think if you understand that AI is a tool and not a complete means to an end, if you never produce the final work without human intervention, you will likely be safe as the legislation and the regulations and the legal framework evolve. As long as you have had a hand in creating that thing in a very overt and final stage, I think you're going to be pretty safe. Great advice. But well, Dave, let's say it's been a real joy talking to you today. Where can people find you and what exciting projects have you got for this year? Uh, there's a couple of things. Um, I have a book. I can be found at uh, 
Dave Polis, davidpolis.com or themarketingdoc.com. Either way, uh, both of them have access to purchase a book, The Marketing Doctor's Survival Notes, which is a primer leading up to AI. No AI included, unfortunately. Um, on marketing tips, tricks, techniques for use in a variety of situations, starting from research and going all the way through to final production and audience segmentation and everything else. It's, it's a soup to nuts. It's cut into very small pieces. It's very bite-sized chunks that you can digest easily um, and learn some of this stuff. If you're not a marketer at heart and you're not a marketer of brain, but you have the need to produce a product or manage a product, this is a really good starting point. That sounds like a great book. Uh, so, and you're on LinkedIn as well, of course? Of course. Well, I hope everybody does look up you and that book because it does sound very good. Dave, thank you for your time today. As I say, I wish we could have uh, kept this going, but sadly, we can't. Quite all right. I've appreciated being here and I've really enjoyed our conversation. Well, that's a wrap on another awesome guest episode for the Evolvepreneur AI Advantage Show. Just before you go, if you like this episode, we would be very grateful for a five star review. Please also consider recommending this show to a friend or two. Make sure you subscribe for future episodes at AIAdvantage.show right now. Until next time, I'm Richard Ray, and if you're an entrepreneur, get the AI advantage today.